gleich. Und zwar, wir haben hier noch ein Video vom New York Watch Guy, New York City Watch Guy. Wir können mal hier schauen, das Video ist ein bisschen älter. Ui, ui, da seid, ui, macht euch bereit, Leute. Jetzt geht's los. Hier haben wir ein paar richtig dicke Dinger. Welcome back to Swiss Watch Game. Today we had a great opportunity to come to New York City. This is my good friend, Instagram famous New NYC Watch Guy. Many of you guys know him by his wide range of watches from complications and brands and also his very... Oh, guck mal, Uni Universal Genève. Wow, Nomos Worldtimer, cool. Was ist das hier? Heftiger. Oh, hier, Heuer haben wir auch hier. Famous for his watch memes. Today we are here with Vas. How are you, man? Nice to see you. Good to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having us in your beautiful office in New York City. And thank you for bringing all the watches. So, Vas, <laughs> wow. tell us something about, about yourself. Skyline. Yeah, I, well, I, I grew up in India. Um, you know, middle class family, didn't have a lot of money. Uh, you know, we had, we had enough to eat. We had uh, basic luxuries, but a watch was not one of those basic luxuries. And uh, in, in Indian society in general, you know, luxuries are, are not really something that you get. Uh, unless you're you're very wealthy and so I was always someone who would try to go to the the local bazaar and try to find an old broken G-Shock or a stolen G-Shock that had come from China and I would I would buy this watch for probably a couple dollars I'd wear it for a couple of weeks uh, and then it would probably break and then my dad still tells me to this day that I would go and try to sell the broken watch to somebody and try to make some money off of it so I guess I've been I've been selling shit to people since I was you know five seven years old um, but I basically came to the US for college um, went to Penn in Philadelphia and sort of that was at my senior year of college was when my My sort of small obsession for watches really started throughout college. I think I would buy more digital stuff. I would buy a Casio uh, atomic watch that could connect to the atomic uh, shocks Casios. And then slowly I, I started to get a little bit more sophisticated, I guess, and refined in my taste. And times have definitely changed. Times have changed. <laughs> Now you know it, the 5K is not the most expensive watch. <laughs> Perfect. So we have a very wide range here from you. Let's start with maybe the, the first piece. What's the... Yeah, so this was the first watch uh, really that I ever bought um, that was uh, sort of an analog watch, if you will. Uh, this was my senior year in college. It was uh, Black Friday, as you know, here in the US is the, the biggest shopping day of the year. So I was 21 years old um, and I was uh, trying, to, trying to impress a girl and she was not there she went away that weekend and i ended up going to uh, to macy's in philadelphia with a girl that i had dated in high school and uh, another girl uh, that was uh, that was also in college with me and so we we all go to the three of us go to macy's and my plan had been that i was going to buy a watch to impress this other girl that i was trying to start dating And I'm looking through the Macy's, you know, windows. Also, near, glaube, ne? Bei, also Mädels werde ich damit nicht uh, anziehen. No, then, you know, it's mostly fashion brands there. They don't really have any, any high-end stuff. And I, I saw this Movado. And again, at this time, I don't even know the difference between quartz yeah, yeah. and mechanical. <laughs> I just saw this and I said, that's an amazing watch. It looks good. And my ex, who was, who was there with me from high school, she was like, that's an awesome watch. You should buy that. And it was it was twelve hundred dollars for oh. a quartz Movado, and I'm sitting Gut there thinking to myself, Geld. I've never spent twelve. Hör mal, da da kostet das Werk also noch weniger als 200 Euro. Ah uh, ja, yeah. so ist das ne? Digga, die Leute ne? Die Leute also wirklich. Twelve hundred dollars on anything? How the hell am I going to afford this watch? So I'm literally on my phone looking for coupon codes. And I find like a, a three, four hundred dollar off coupon code plus a Black Friday sale. Plus, they said if you sign up for a Macy's credit card, you'll get an additional 15 percent off. So I sign up for everything at the store. And I think I ended up da hat der Einkauf, der Checkout Prozess nur so eine Stunde gedauert. paying like 750 or 800 for this watch, which was still the most expensive thing I've ever bought in my life. Um, and then I wore this every day from 2008 
till 2011, literally every day of the year I, I wore this. I mean, you can see the, the bracelet is scuffed. And, it, and the crazy part is, I think I only replaced the battery one time in this kann watch. Ihn schon um, and, and that was it. And it ran auch. for for four years. Ich wette, er hat sich als König gefühlt damals. I would never wear this watch ever again. It looks ridiculous on my wrist. It's like 45 millimeters. Um, but I'll never sell this watch either because it was, well and it's real heavy. <laughs> but I'll never sell this watch because it was the first one that I ever bought with sort of my own money. Of course. And again, like at that time, that was a lot of money when you were back in college. Yep. But it's still kind of cool though. You know? It is. It's cool. Yeah, it's a cool it's watch. Beginning. It's the beginning for sure. Chronograph and everything. Nice. So what's the what's what's this boy right here? So after the Movado that I wore for three years, um, I was it was 2011. I didn't have I still didn't have a lot of money. I was running my my startup at the time, so didn't have much money at all. But was you know at least at least making a living and able to pay my bills. And I saw a an ad in a in a magazine for a Zenith. And I remember seeing this watch and again at this. Das ist so die typische Uhr auch für Leute, die so jetzt irgendwie nicht wirklich informiert sind, die Uhr so sehen, sehen so ein Uhrwerk, haben noch nicht viel Ahnung und dann kauft man sowas. Ist aber keine, ist, ist okay, ne? At this point, I still don't know anything about any watch brand, really. I've heard of Rolex and that's really it. And I see uh, an ad for Zenith and I'm like, wow, that, that's a really, really cool watch. I wonder what that is. So I do a little bit of research. And obviously the ad that I saw was for a watch that was... Irgendwie kann man bei ihm seine Sammlung deutlich besser zuhören als beim Curved Looking. Überleg mal, wie angenehm das hier ist, ne? Da das siehst du, ne? Das sind Kleinigkeiten, aber irgendwie, weiß ich nicht, irgendwie, ne? Hier passt es und da drüben passt es nicht. It's $150,000, uh, so I couldn't afford that. But I found this Zenith El Primero Chronomaster with this open face dial. And I just, I, I was, I was just taken. I was like, wow, you can see the insides of a watch. I, I never thought that that was possible. So I decide that this is the watch that I need to try to find. And it was about a six or $7,000 watch at the time. Uh, I, I did not have six or $7,000 to spend on a watch. So I said, okay, I need to find this watch pre-owned. Um, so I look all over New York. At the time, you know, Chrono 24 wasn't really that big. Uh, in 2011. I don't even know if it existed, frankly, in 2011. I go on eBay, but people had told me, oh, you can't really trust watches on eBay. You never know. And because I didn't know anything about watches, I was scared to buy a couple thousand dollar watch on eBay. What happens if it's fake and I can't find out that it's fake? So I look at all the stores, nothing exists. I'm on my way to Italy um, for, uh, for a basketball event for my company. And I decide, okay, maybe in Italy, because I'd heard Italy was a great place for watches, I was like, maybe in Rome, I'll be able to find this watch. So prior to leaving, I go on Google Maps and I mark every single watch store in Rome. And so I fly to Rome, my girlfriend's with me, and as we're traveling, as we're walking around Rome, sightseeing, some... I think so much attention has this watch never been in the past. Weiter geht's, next model. Good stuff, though, for sure. It's not bad. Yeah, it's stuff. not bad. El Primero, Zenith, you know, it's Classic. it's as good as it gets. I think uh, we all did uh, this at one point. <laughs> <laughs> to see if a watch is real. Or the sweeping seconds. Right, right. <laughs> so I see you have uh, like a wide range of brands, like I said before. Here, Movado, Zenith, and I uh, see also an Omega. What's your fascination with uh, with the Speedmaster? So I'll be honest, the 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 Snoopy, which is what you have there, was was bought because of the hype. When it first came out, I didn't. Even ja, hier hat mich immer fasziniert hier diese ersten 14 Sekunden. Da war irgendwas mit der Mondlandung oder ich weiß nicht oder mit der Mission. Da wurde irgendwie eine Entscheidung getroffen, die sehr schwerwiegend war und dann halt alle gerettet hat. Irgendwie sowas war's. What could you do in 14 seconds? Das fand ich irgendwie ein nettes Accessoire, so eine Kleinigkeit, ne? Failure is not an option. Das ist wohl wahr. Sollte man sich Even think so twice about it. I said, ah, just another Speedmaster limited edition, no big deal. And so I blame Red Bar for this because uh, I'm, a, I'm a big Red Bar New York guy. I'm there, you know, at least 15, 20 times a year on Wednesday nights I'm there. And And Adam Craniotis, who, who started Red Bar. mussten genau die Triebwerke für 14 Sekunden zünden. Okay. Red Bar has a Snoopy. And I would keep seeing this Snoopy every week it would be there. And you know, the cool part about the Snoopy really, right, is, is it's all about the loom. So yeah. 
you know, the, the, the thing about Red Bar is you people come with, with their loom sticks and then you do this <laughs> yeah, yeah. and you and you're just looking, you're like, oh my god, okay. that's so cool. <laughs> I need that. <laughs> and so I think of all the watches out there in the world, as far as execution of loom goes, I don't think anyone's done it better than Omega on the Snoopy. And so I, I sort of ended up buying this watch um, because of the loom factor more than anything else. Would I buy a Nomos? I would have said, you know what? Das zum Beispiel, ich weiß nicht, die Nomos World Time war mir so noch nie am Schirm. Klar ist jetzt auch kein Topseller ne, am Lederband und so weiter, aber coole Uhr. I think my collection has sort of outgrown Nomos at this point. I don't know that I would buy one, but this watch I think is a very, very special piece that was made uh, for Wempy here in, in New York City when they first launched uh, in the US. And it's, you know, it, it's, I'm, I'm a sucker for world time watches. I love world time watch. I think there's something romantic yeah. about having all these different countries on a dial. And thinking about them. And, and thinking about York. going there, right? And you're like, oh, I, yeah, you, you look at these Come names on, and you go, okay, I've been to like York, these five like countries. <laughs> I almost want to go to these places <laughs> just to be able to land in that country <laughs> and press the button and say I'm in that country now. It's, it's something so cool okay. about world timers. And, and so when I saw this, there's two cool things about this Nomos glass uh, uh, world timer, you know, climber for this one um he started writing about this i think you know probably 2000 i want to say like 2012 2013 was when he sort of first started writing about these watches and at the time like i didn't know anything about vintage i i was sort of you know zenith uh i had bought a glass shoot original panamatic lunar that was sort of my first like big purchase and and I didn't know much about vintage, but what I started to realize was I had this itch to keep collecting, but buying modern watches is very expensive. Yeah. And you know, I didn't have much money. There's only so much that you can buy when it comes to modern. But with vintage, there's you know, there's a couple things. One, you can always find a good deal if you search hard enough. Yeah. Two, th there's there's the search oh, itself. Like one. the search itself, I think, is is half the is half the fun. Yeah. Um, and so I sort of got the itch for vintage. And the watch that got me sort of into it was Universal Geneva. And actually, this was the first one that I ever bought uh, from a dealer in Mexico City. And, you know, it came. I again, had no idea if it was going to be real or broken. Did this. I did that. It worked. <laughs> um, and so, I've, you know, it's like an oversized tri-compax, sort of 36 millimeter, which a lot of these tend to be like 33, 34. And, and for me... You know, I don't buy any watches that I don't wear myself. So I'll never buy a 33, 34 millimeter watch because it's not about just collecting, it's about actually wearing everything yeah, that you buy. Like and so that. the fact that this was like a 35, 36 millimeter watch that I could actually wear was really awesome. You can see the, uh, the calendar on this is actually in Spanish. So it's not, even yes. in, uh, it's not even in English, which I don't think I even realized when I bought it. And the song I was like, wait a minute, is this fake? Like, what are these, what are these names? Habt ihr gehört? Er hat die Uhr gekauft und später erst gemerkt, dass die Datumscheibe einfach nicht Englisch ist. Names inside these windows and it turned out it's a Spanish calendar. But then, you know, from there, sort of, the Nina was my holy grail. This was the watch that I wanted for the longest time from Universal Geneve and the prices just skyrocketed. Yeah. By the time I started collecting UGs, I got in right as it was going this way. And this watch had already skyrocketed to like thirty, forty thousand dollars on <laughs> in auctions, awesome. and I was like, "There's, there's no way I'm going to spend that much money on on a vintage watch." And so, you know, UG has sort of flattened and it's sort of gotten a little soft. And I've spent basically the last five to six years just searching, searching, searching for for UGs at auction uh, on Chrono, on eBay, from random dealers, like wherever I can look for a Universal Geneva, I look for one, and I, I've it's gotten nice. really so lucky markets. in that. I've paid well below market value for just about every UG that I've bought. Um, and, and the cool thing I think with UGs is the, is the way you can play with the straps. Yeah, sure. um, for me, this was the closest thing to a Rolex Daytona 6263 yeah. without it being a Rolex. And I'm not a Rolex guy. I've never bought a Rolex other than I did once buy a 6263. But other than that, I've <laughs> never bought a Rolex. And I, they're ne you're never going to make any more UGs ever again. Yes. Um, Oh, heftig. Ja, er hat schon eine Sammlung hier, ne? Um, and I think the design that they had in the 1960s, it's just, it's so amazing that these watches were made in, in the 60s. Even to this day, in, in 2020, 
I don't know that anyone's making such cool designs uh, on chronographs, like the big eye here. Um, it's, it's just so cool to have this asymmetric design between the, the sub-registers, which I don't know anyone who's really doing stuff like that today. Nah, that's super cool. What's your favorite out of these UGs? That is, so, so Jorn was probably one of the, it was. I have also had a moment, one Jorn, one Jorn, I don't know which one is, Moonface, Luna. The uh, Jorn, so you will probably now FP Jorn not so many contact points, but I'm going to go and try to buy a Luna, maybe, to buy. And I think I will probably also keep it. However, my absolute grail watch from them, this uh, second Mord is the first independent brand that I really fell in love with. Um, I think what he's done, sort of his unique designs, what he does with the movements, being able to craft them out of out of gold is is awesome. Ich glaube, so als serious Sammler sollte man vielleicht eine F Peugeot haben, oder? So einfach Memo an mich selber, oder? And um, the watch that I thought was the most unique that he had ever made was this Octa Calendrier, which is an annual calendar. But the coolest part, I think, is sort of this retrograde date that he does in, in almost a semicircle or, yeah. or along the outside edge of the watch. And of all the things he's made, you know, the chronometer blue and all the hype around that yeah. these days, um, the tourbillons are amazing. But as far as something that's somewhat affordable, uh, but still incredibly unique, it's to me, it's this watch. And again, like being able to play with the straps yes. on a Jorn, like this is... This is a watch from the Amsterdam watch company that I picked up in Amsterdam. And cool. it really just changes the look of this watch completely because most Jorns come on like a very traditional croc or alligator strap. And this makes it look krass. like such a, sehr, such a casual watch. Um, for two, three years, so heftig. You know, the off-center dial, the, the, the work inside of that, the fact that it's so usable, and probably the coolest thing about this, the thing I hate the most about perpetual calendars and annual calendars is that if you don't keep them on a winder, yeah. you, you, you open your safe, you know, two months later, and all of a sudden you're like, you gotta go find a, <laughs> a pusher to change the date, or you sit here and you're like, this, right? He made an annual calendar with no pushers. Everything is controlled through the crown, that's it. So if I want to change the month, if I want to change the day, the date, and the time, everything through this just based on how far you pull it out and the position, and then you move it. And so to me, this is the most brands in the world from the Richemont brands to the Swatch Group brands to the independents. What is the one watch the coolest motherfucker yeah. in the room. <laughs> this is yeah. the watch. It's MBNF. Um, it's it's, it's just so crazy. Cool like, who who's crazy enough to come up with these designs and have a curved crystal? They're yeah. they're right there at the top, along with the MBNFs of the world. Um, you know, the fact that there's a, a pusher to wind this watch, I think, is is really cool. Uh, something that's unique. Something that nobody has ever done before, as far as I know. Movement finishing is, is incredible. Christie's it's lightweight, Christie's it's a titanium case, enamel dial. It's got a little bit of everything that you want. And it just looks, it's so cool with the, with the fusée chain on, on the side of it. Um, I, I don't, it's just, it's amazing. It's just so cool. And then Romain's such a nice guy. And, and that's, that's part of it, right? These, in, in today's world, I think with watch collecting, there's just, there's so many things that have gotten overhyped. You go into a boutique, you can't buy anything. There's yeah. nothing available for nothing sale. Stock, yeah. And, and you know, when I think about these as pieces of art, you know, people collect art as well because they want to have a connection with the artist and they want to go to the shows and that's really cool. I wonder what that is. And, and then, so I Google him, I see some of his stuff on Instagram and I'm like, oh, this must be a thirty forty thousand $40,000 watch, shit, like, Man, that's expensive. So then I go to his website, 5,900 Swiss francs for a fully <laughs> custom built watch. The color of dial you want, the type of hands you want, the type of numerals you want. Okay. And so I was like, wow, at this slit, original clasp, um, and it's just an, it's an unbelievable condition. Oh, that's I mean, beautiful. Who's and the bracelet's bracelet? super cool, huh? It's so Those cool. Gaps in between. It's so cool. Probably comfy as well for the summer. 
and the fact that it comes with a box and uh, the uh, papers. I mean, it's, so it's nuts. We know the owner was uh, Luigi. It's had, <laughs> definitely had good taste. <laughs> Beautiful, oh, amazing. And so, yeah, in, in terms of the watch that I'm probably spending, that I say from now to, to the day I die and hopefully they bury me in it, what is that watch going to be? <laughs> to me, it's the 5170P from, from Patek. Um, and, that, and that's probably what I spend a lot of time wearing now. I think the, ja, ich auch so the dial on this Uhr. thing is ich just, ich it's unreal. It is, it is the best Aber dial that Patek has ever made in my, in my opinion. Brutal. And then the fact that they were able, and I didn't even realize this when I first found out about this watch, the fact that all the indices are diamond baguettes yeah. is just bonkers to me. Because uh, I would never ever wear a watch with any bling on it. Nothing, no rainbow Daytona, yeah. none of that nonsense. I can't do it, I won't do it. But to have found a watch that was able to integrate diamonds so subtly into the dial that nobody knows until I tell them and point it out, I think is amazing. And then, yeah, you cool. know, the Patek yeah, chrono movements movement, yes. are just bonkers. Ja, sehr, sehr interessanter äh, äh, Instagram-Kanal auf jeden Fall. Also muss ich sagen. Mhm.